Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to The Right Opinion, the home of a twat with too much free time. And today we return to the more relaxed side of YouTube, because honestly, all the high stakes stuff like Marina Joyce was just too riveting. And I don't want to have to put you guys through that emotional trauma again. So we're going to the vlogging scene, because I have dabbled in that before. However, this time we're taking a trip for a very different purpose, for a very different individual. You see, I first heard about Emma Chamberlain when a friend mentioned her to me in passing, told me that it would make a good video, and there was a lot of content to discuss. I mean, himself had made videos too. I encountered her again when I was making my beauty community video. I was doing research on people who were involved in that sort of area and she came up. Now I didn't include her in that video because I didn't really consider her necessarily part of that community, but she was working with individuals like James Charles and so on, so I rightfully stumbled into her. I knew there were a lot of videos being made and I was like, all right, she looks like a fairly regular lass. You know, whatever floats your boat. There were more videos and more videos and I still didn't know what was happening, but now I finally had a bit more time freed up, I decided to look into it. Because with a bit of research, I can fairly affirmatively say that this is a very interesting case. So Emma Chamberlain, she is a 17-year-old vlogger and a very successful one at that, which, you know, not depressing in the slightest. Who cares? Not me. <laughs> Anyhow, vlogging is an incredibly saturated genre. I've had friends who try vlogging and it did not work out for them. Mainly because I think it's so hard to define yourself with something that so many other people have access to. The only thing that really makes the genre particularly unique is the fact that people seem to enjoy themselves doing it. Which probably explains why so many people do actually vlog. I mean, in a way, if I could do something like that, I probably would. One day, my friends, the vlogging opinion will be a reality, I'm sure. But Emma Chamberlain isn't just any vlogger. In fact, many have branded her the anti-vlogger. I think that's a very interesting way to describe her. You see, her brand is definitely unique, and it's clear why her ascension to the top of the YouTube totem pole was so rapid. She has this very sardonic, identifiable tone that doesn't really fit in with the normal YouTube vlogger vibes. And I think this is interesting in the whole context of the vlogging scene. This one would be really good for your cousin who just got accepted into Alpha Pi and is so excited. He's probably a douchebag. This is great for him. I'd flex, but I like this shirt. Ah, so funny. He would definitely wear that to a frat party and no girls would talk to him. But he doesn't know that that's going to happen, so it's okay. There's been this narrative drummed up recently that many creators themselves have fallen out of touch with the desires of their viewers. And honestly, on one hand, it's a sentiment that I agree with, particularly with that in the vlogging industry. But on the flip side, I also feel that part of the change has been undertaken by the audience. The shift in general sentiment rather than the creators necessarily. We have definitely become more cynical, and I think that has made many of the vloggers and their ploys more transparent. Fame does what it does to a lot of people. It pushes people into their own little bubble, and I don't think that has changed necessarily. I just think people are more increasingly aware of it. Emma Chamberlain definitely plays into that self-awareness with a sort of snark and sass desperately needed, and will explore the success very soon, but it does have its flaws. In the last few months, as noted, Emma Chamberlain's been in a bit of hot water drama drama and drama firstly for a merchandising situation and then for behaviors that just show a double standard that didn't match her attitude of the old content this in a way goes hand in hand with a lot of the rise of commentary on these creators we've definitely become much more critical towards the vlogging community this is for better and for worse as documented in my previous videos on one hand it pushes the community for higher standards on the other i think sometimes the criticism can lean into unreasonable territories and at the end of the day it's important that we as creators have some sort of gauge on the criticism that we deliver i've often crashed with my fellow creators over the notion of criticizing our peers because in many ways a cohesive community is a functional one and doing that is often seen as, quote, burning bridges. But at the right opinion, we always come equipped with a Molotov cocktail. So cheers to that. There will be some times when I agree, sometimes when I don't. Today, we participate in the exercise of critical thinking because Emma Chamberlain has been the subject of extensive criticism that itself should be brought into the light and scrutinized, just like Emma Chamberlain has been herself. The central narrative is that Emma Chamberlain has changed, which on one hand isn't a huge deal. We as individuals typically evolve, and it wouldn't be fair to hold people to previous standards they may have denounced or left behind. But on the other hand, people say that she has changed in a way that undermines her platform in the first place, basically turning her into everything that she would hate or mock. This has led to a lot of videos calling her a hypocrite. 
and content that is skewed her for supposed double standards. However, I think they may in fact underlie an overarching problem in the industry that I think has been overlooked by the situation. So join me, The Right Opinion, as we take a trip back into the vlogging industry, because although Zoella and Alfie days were tasty topics, the appetite has readily returned, and I suggest we address that now. The plan shall be to break down the old style, bloggers, explain why Emma has emerged, the subsequent criticism of her, and then break it all down in a hopefully concise style. So join me as we ask ourselves, did Emma Chamberlain become everything she hated? In the words of Kyle from behind the meme, here we go. Vlogging has really emerged in the last few years, and I've documented this before. But there is something very intimate about the relationship that is created. When we look over the last few years, we can see a very interesting trend. There are creators like Alfie Days, Tyler Oakley, Zoella, Casper Lee, who really came out as the vloggers to be reckoned with. Now, I've said this before, and I'll probably say it again, but I don't really rate them, mainly because I honestly found them far too saccharine for my bitter taste. Guess who's back, 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 back again, 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 Alfie's back. <laughs> <laughs> Tell your friends. Truly enlightening content, my heart leaps with exuberance. As creators, we typically need a journey to go from one strength to another strength. A viewer needs that feeling of progression and that reason to keep watching the videos. With the new technological developments, it provided a quality that definitely contributed to this movement forward and brought us into a new era of creators. This led to a lot of videos of basically people doing challenges, reactions, and so on. They weren't really that meaningful, but it was something to look at. It was a progression. However, that was really part of the clickbait, because once you enter the video, you're normally met with some sort of bloke who's walking along with your life, and there you go. Another huge appeal was that these people tended to collaborate a lot, and that created a greater syndicate where people were watching to see their favorite creators in the most ambitious pre-Infinity War crossover. These were all components that worked at the time, because it was something new. It was something that YouTube audiences weren't particularly familiar with, and along with it came very specific personalities, these relatable happy people, because back then, demographics and culture just seemed to be aspiring for something a bit happier than what we're looking for today. These happy friends seeing each other doing all these wacky challenges haha <laughs> wow those two guys kissed isn't that crazy i want to die the thing is that it seems over the last couple years we have evolved our tastes i no longer want everyone to be friends anymore we no longer want people to just be collaborating because it gets boring and anyway another more creative more interesting genre has taken the place of that idea. It's called story time animation. And I've had my criticisms of those creators, but let me tell you, on a purely entertainment-based value, they beat the old community vloggers on every single front. And they do something else, which is much more genius. They appeal to nostalgia, which is not only timeless, but always something looked on with more rose-colored glasses, thus matching the tone of Glee much more. And as culture itself becomes much darker in the last few years, I mean, hell, one of the biggest songs of 2017 was the Suicide Hot line number. These old community vloggers are starting to look like they've been left behind. There are many other elements that have played into their failure, the lack of progression. I mean, they've all bought their mansion, cozied up to themselves. What else are they going to do? But it's more than just that. This is where we reintroduce commentary, which as mentioned earlier, we have become a lot more critical of the culture that these creators promote and one that many viewers have grown to despise. The thing about those vloggers is they rose in a time where criticism was very seldom and things like YouTube merch were not scrutinized or held to any sort of account. At the end of the day, you buy them or you don't. And what a lot of vloggers did was create expensive branding. And when individuals like Jackmate came onto the scene, they picked a lot of the community apart. These are people who have never dealt with criticism like this before. And I think whether I agree with the criticism or not, as expressed, whether I agree with the character depictions, one thing that I do agree with is that a lot of the creators crafted a contradiction within their content. They wanted to be this boy slash girl next door who was looking out for you while living in a mansion and selling merchandise dice at rather extortionate prices, exploiting the consumer while telling them that they cared about them. I don't think living a wealthy life means selling out your core appeal necessarily, but I think the problem was they were trying to emulate this persona that these circumstances no longer supported, and therefore a lot of them felt forced. So what has happened? Well, 
Vlogging has appeared to go the way of the anti-hero of recent. We don't want people who try to be perfect human beings and transcend us with their wonderful advice because at the end of the day, none of us are perfect. And given the sheer misery in the last couple of years, we don't want unconditionally happy people. Those days are gone. Come of the hour, come of the obnoxious, inappropriate, but still somewhat redeemable characters. We were looking for an edge, and that transformation was coming gradually. People seemed increasingly desperate for a defining feature rather than just the fact that they were friends, and they existed, and they did challenges. This was a new energy to a lot of styles. Compare the past popular vlogger and my new boots. These are from Russell and Bromley, and they are perfect for rainy, cold days where you've got to trek around town getting all the last minute presents. You're gonna stay here. You look so tiny compared to that unit. Right, we can jump in the car and make our way into town. We got the radio tunes on. Heart Extra Xmas. To a present popular vlogger. I'm oh, right. been cooped up, bro. Been With so too much work. I just wanna go out and do better. Let's go do better. Past for well, this video today that we're filming for my main, my pointless vlog channel. This is gonna be. A super interesting video. Like I'm super, super interested in the topic. I'm really, really excited to get talking about it. Present. Jason is surprising his nanny with ten thousand dollars today. <laughs> Why? Vlog misses a bitch. <laughs> uh, fuck, we don't have any video today. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, take it, take it, take it, take it. Hey, mailman. <laughs> How would you like 10 grand? <laughs> also, this kind of explains why a lot of the older vloggers were British and the newer ones are American. I mean, can you see Zoella being that loud and out there? I'm just saying. I feel like this has been happening over the last few years with these new vloggers. The reason I'm saying this is because I think some people see Chamberlain as a dramatic shift, but I much more see her as a completion of a very interesting cycle to finally expel the previous generation of vloggers who themselves were viewed as these rather softly elitist bunch of creators who enabled a facade when the truth was much different. And whereas other new vloggers have certainly challenged that, there is still an element of superficiality. And that's what changes with Emma Chamberlain. So with this video, I decided to undertake a lot of research into Emma's content, past and present, to understand what really makes her so bloody special. When she started, she appeared to do these sorts of travel vlogs, which didn't really take off as content, but definitely set up some of her very idiosyncratic traits. That means basically traits that are identifiable to yourself. Fun fact about me, I don't have Spotify Premium. Put me on the ox if you want to be annoyed. Haha. <laughs> You see, at first, her videos were rooted in the very traditional vlog formula, the very Casey Neistat style idea. What you do is what shapes the vlogs and makes them interesting. And someone like Neistat does really capture that. But it didn't really work for her. Maybe because as a smaller YouTuber, you can't quite capture the sheer grandiosity of a life like Neistat's. And you're competing with people who have so many more resources than yourself. What appeared to change was when she dipped into actually a more commentary oriented style with videos such as we owe the dollar store an apology and her first day of school vlog as you see here's what zoella had to say about school i always just think you have to concentrate on tasks like the second you let any little bit of anxiety come in it will try and take over but if you sort of bat it away and think no actually i want to learn this today or no i'm going to really concentrate on what my teacher's saying to me right now because i don't want you distracting me don't stay up all night watching youtube videos and Emma Chamberlain had some very different words of wisdom. I have to go back to the one place that sucks out all of the happiness out of my life, and that is school. Nothing about this situation excites me. Nothing about that makes me want to smile. If I try to vlog at school, I'm probably going to get my phone taken away. But you know what? I don't even care because YouTube is life and YouTube is better than school. So I prioritize this over school. Watching the videos, I received the idea that Zoella has this sort of same impression of school that Emma Chamberlain does. And if they were to sit down and discuss what they don't like about school, they'd probably agree. The difference is that Emma Chamberlain doesn't sugarcoat her work 
words. She doesn't talk down to the audience like she's been there. She just says she absolutely loathes school. And although the brave face argument may serve as somewhat better advice on Zoella's part, people still have that voice in their head that represents the unfiltered, judgmental, critical, nihilistic view that Emma Chamberlain was never afraid to hold back on and deliver with the most brute honesty. A famous Freudian theory documents that of the id, the ego, and the superego, represented on this little diagram here. Now, generally, I don't rate Freud too much as a guy who provided decent amounts of evidence. And this idea, I think, is very reductionist of how the human mind works. It's not that simple to categorize. However, it does somewhat represent the conflict that many of us have. The id is typically seen as what represents our more self-centered desires, and we typically internalize that. But it still exists. Whereas the ego is the more reasonable side, and the superego is the very selfless aspect. Emma seems to have taken this formula and just shoved the ego and superego out the window and left us with this rather straightforward depiction of a pissed off teenager who has to go to a shitty school and learn things that she'll never have to apply. No one really wants to admit it, but she does really relate to them. But Chamberlain's success doesn't stop there. There is a nuance to it. And that's where we talk about the delivery. In her first Q&A, Emma is asked about her inspirations. She lists Nystat, which can be particularly represented in her early vlogs, and then Cody Ko, who is obviously quite a different style of creator. Cody Ko, he's so freaking funny. If you haven't seen his videos, I would definitely recommend. However, what I found even more interesting is the fact that her favorite show was The Office, which once again, a great comedy. But she also said her favorite character was Dwight, who represents that more cynical creation. Although his love for the system is probably running counter to Chamberlain's expressed hatred for it. She's clearly been very much in touch with the YouTube atmosphere. She says she's been watching it forever. And on top of that, her knowledge of comedy and commentary definitely shines through in the best of her content, particularly in the edits, which capture an energy probably even stronger than her favorites like Cody Ko. So with all this in mind, what I find very smart about Emma Chamberlain's style is that she basically wrapped what could have been rather obnoxious entitled rants in a seething tone that seemed to undermine that negativity. And when she did go on rants, it felt somewhat justified and relatable to an audience, such as her school rants. She followed this school rant with a discussion about her school uniform. And this could have been rather innocuous and not the sort of thing that would create any tone or variety following on from her rant about school. But she changes it up and sarcastically mocks how rigid school uniforms are by presenting them like some sort of frock for a fashion show. You can see we have the nice um quarter zip looking thing we have here it's a nice very trendy pleated skirt because you know pleated skirts are so in this season van socks super trendy and cute and some white vans i like this i think this is pretty damn good content and much more refreshing than a lot of previous creators who i could never relate to but chamberlain appeals to the inner cynic the inner nihilist Hell, the inner hedonist. And when she was in that situation that many people were in and evoked a much more honest reaction than many people really have the balls to do, it was cathartic for viewers in a way to have someone to just be able to go off like that. Chamberlain represented the vlogger that people didn't have to aspire to be because they already were. The brand anti-vlogger I feel isn't quite right. I feel kind of differently. She just represented a vlogger that even in her arguably imperfect state, people could trust. People knew that what they saw was what she felt. And that's overwhelming in a genre that is derided by many as fake and creating this unreal idea of people's lives. Let me bring this back to commentary then. One of the greatest criticisms that we had of vloggers was that they were disingenuous and were acting like they had all this love for their viewers when this wasn't the case and they were clearly out to benefit themselves. Chamberlain skips the middleman and doesn't deceive her viewers with what she cares about. This allows her to undermine the usual criticism that she is feigning an excessive amount of interest for the audience's well-being because to actually make that claim there first needs to exist an excessive amount of interest for the audience's well-being. And so, like anyone who has some exceeding quality, which she definitely demonstrated, her content blew up and people tuned in from it. She seemed to represent that middle finger to the previous generations. If you've ever watched the honest translations of like politicians and such, that's how I see Emma Chamberlain. However, with the blow up came incredible success, which appeared to threaten the very foundations that she had constructed her platform on. So let's talk about that. <laughs> Emma Chamberlain's growth came incredibly fast. 
post and with her rather admirable work ethic and the consistency of her content meant that it just created this huge snowball effect that keeps on rolling. However, when you acquire such a reputation, one of the things that many people will advise you to do is move to a city which is considered an entertainment hub. The reason this is, is because although you can film a YouTube video anywhere, there are many more opportunities that YouTube can launch, which can only be fully realized by going places. And the obvious choice for those in the media industry is Los Angeles, California. Another big reason to do this is because you normally enter deals, partnerships, sponsorships. You know, this is how the modern creator makes the real bucks. YouTube is an unreliable method of income. There are many more sources that provide stability. And like anyone, Emma decided to pursue those. One of those was the ever reliable YouTuber merchandise. Many creators, large and small, have generated a lot of additional profit for themselves through the trusty commodities that they can flog to their audiences. But you see, this time there was a different, more creative idea. You see, Emma, or more likely her agents, decided that it would be an interesting business move to pixelate the merch. I assume to create some sort of aura of mystery. But it didn't quite work. It more generated an aura of outrage. Because whoever was in charge of this probably was not quite in towns with the standards that YouTube audiences set. They want their merch affordable and they want to be able to see it as well. If this was done for some kind of upper class clothing brand, it may have been lauded by critics as an avant-garde move. But no, people just want it straight to the point. There was also a suspicious resemblance to uh, AliExpress merchandise once the presentation was actually revealed. This caused further for all and she did address this in a response in which she gave some rather erratic explanation oh back to what we were talking about somebody said that my clothing line's really expensive i'd like to say that i didn't come up with the prices for my clothing line yes it's technically mine i guess but not really because all i did was design the clothes and half of it yeah so like it's not really up to me those things and honestly i agree i think it's really really expensive and honestly i would be a little bit Jason. triggered too and surprise surprise this didn't appease the masses either. After all, she has to anticipate to an extent that merchandise with her name will delegate her some responsibility. It is an implicit endorsement of the prices regardless. And that means having more foresight when you enter these deals. And as I said in my Smosh video, that's what makes businesses so dangerous in their influence. You're the person who's gonna suffer the flack. And when responding to such criticism, you have to keep that in mind. This incident in particular really galvanized the narrative that she had kind of sold out. That she was essentially becoming everything that she had previously mocked and criticized, which was supposedly illuminated by moments like these. I've been seeing this shirt on Pinterest. I'll insert some pictures. So this shirt, $450. <laughs> I just, there's no way I could do this. I can't just buy a $450 shirt. I'm not a celebrity and I'm not loaded, so. First we're going to Gucci. We have to go to Gucci first. Please no. get you a Gucci belt, a good and fast Gucci belt. They're literally making me go to Gucci and spend like $400 on it's a okay, Gucci belt time. for I'm this stupid, bad. no, I'm yeah, but. Bad. Feeling like a real big fat right now. Yeah, I feel like a douchebag every day carrying this around. Yeah. We'd have to. First they got these socks. I got a Gucci fanny pack. No, Grayson, Grayson, you no, this is a show yours that we're only one at a time. <laughs> I got my Gucci slide. Then after that, I'm gonna go thrifting for a little bit because I need to do some hardcore thrifting. I haven't thrifted in a very long time. When I go thrifting, I don't feel bad about buying new things because thrifting is so cheap, so it's not even an issue. The other day, I was walking around Melrose in LA. There's a lot of cool vintage stores and they're all overpriced, but whatever. I had narrowed it down to 20, but I was like, this is going to be at least $2,000 if I buy all these jeans, meaning that I have to narrow it down a little bit more. Well, and I spent dollars on jeans, but the thing is, is that I've never been happier to do something in my life. I was thrilled to give her all my money. Further to this, like the community does, there were a load more allegations dealt out. Some to do with bullying, insensitive tweets, and also a very bizarre one about blackface, which is clearly just some fairly cheap makeup. I mean, it was from the dollar store. And what had occurred was the classic slippery slope of criticism. As soon as one vaguely reasonable criticism came out against her, a load more follow, each more ridiculous than the last. However, we're going to set those aside and say, in my opinion, I think most of them are fairly unfounded. And without further evidence, and clear evidence at least, it's hard to buy into them. So I want to discuss the greater narrative itself. 
that she as a person has changed. Which, you know, looking at what we do have is a credible theory. But the thing is, in spite of the criticism that I think can be levied against her with regards to her personality, I honestly don't think she herself ever changed that much. I think if you look at her old content, that cynicism, that attitude is still there. In fact, the whole situation, in my opinion, exposes how the only thing that changes is the circumstance which altered the interpretation of her content. Chamberlain was never your happy girl next door. She wasn't a bad person per se, but her brand was on the basis of being rather brutal and open in her pursuits for success. Therefore, a lot of her attitude can be explained by that. She didn't wear Gucci because she wasn't, quote, famous. And now she is famous, well, she's gonna wear Gucci. I mean, she was a stingy lass who wouldn't even shell out on Spotify Premium. And now she's probably turning in the racks. She's probably got a Tidal account too, which, no, isn't the most advisable thing regardless, but still. At the end of the day, the people who put someone like Emma Chamberlain on a podium can't be surprised in a way at these consequences. I think many people had Emma viewed as this sort of populist vlogger who represented that movement against the establishment of previous vloggers. However, what I think she often represented was herself. And because she was living a fairly regular life at that point, that on the basis of itself tended to resonate with a lot of viewers who also had their own concerns. And now she's part of the industry and the circumstances have changed. She still has those principles. They're just not as relatable. She always came across as a rather amoral person on these issues. But buying gifts is so stressful. Every single year I have a very tough time buying gifts for people because number one, I don't want to spend money on anyone. That's the thing. She hasn't changed. It's just her circumstances that have. And because Emma is no longer going to school because she's no longer doing the things that normal people do. She loses that factor of being that person. However, on the other hand, I still think she's retained a lot of these key commentary components. One of her newest videos was very similar in tone to the older ones. The only thing I'd say is that the editing is becoming more overbearing than her old stuff. And although it's definitely welcome, it's sometimes a bit too much. Let's just get right into it. Let's get started. Emma Chamberlain has become rich and famous, and there will be some people that will probably not be able to relate to that in the way that they related to Emma's old content. However, it was a compromise Emma clearly felt was necessary to provide her with some longevity in the case that YouTube falls through. And she has to provide that progression that many people do look for. She had this opportunity to go out and live her dreams with people like the Dolan twins, and she's going to go and do that even if it's not my idea of the dream. Equally, another issue is that her changing circumstances can often mean that she can't behave the same. She always had that slightly smarmy attitude, but now she's successful, it can come across rather differently, such as when she accepted the Streamy Award. Scared, but I just want to say thank you guys for being so welcoming, because I'm new, you know? Um, it's been great. Thanks. I guess. As a larger creator, you can't make a moment like that kind of awkward and sarcastic or else it just feels inherently condescending to the audience and extremely, extremely awkward. And once again, I feel like as a person, she hasn't changed and that may be part of the problem because although I feel she should definitely retain a grip on those traits that make her content appealing, if you want to stay in touch with your audience, you have to be somewhat respondent to your changing relationship with them and the responsibility that that ensues. With that said, she has no obligation to and as it stands, she is relatively successful. And although backlash is inevitable, I don't think it's significant enough to fade her. And she still has a lot of appealing elements. The question of this video then was one that yielded from a lot of videos that I'd watched on her with those labels and how she's changed. Did she become everything she hated? And I think the fallacy lies within the question in a way, because I don't think Emma ever hated the opportunism of her previous generation. She just never tried to cover it up in any other way necessarily, other than the way it affected her as a person. And at the start, she never had the opportunities that those previous generation style vloggers had. However, her style did bring a refreshing take to those who wanted something more believable. And that overlapped into the conflicts of interest we're witnessing today. Because those opportunities came and she took them and did what many other vloggers have already done. And she never claimed to be against that. I understood that many people may argue that the fame has gone to her head. But I think it's more the fame has changed her lifestyle in a way that different differentiates it from what made it relatable in the first place for some viewers and thus affecting the relationship. 
I think that's irreconcilable in a way because seeing someone whine about school is different to seeing someone whine about something you can't relate to, particularly in relativity to your state. Seeing rich people complain is never fun. With that said, she has mostly avoided as coming across as too petty and she's still doing well with audience reception. And so in that instance, I have to give credit to her. She's definitely slipped up from time to time, but as someone who is 17, who has blown up so incredibly quickly, I think she is handling it rather well. The story of Emma Chamberlain is one that is rather interesting because she is a significant character in the recent evolution of blogging, definitely representing a very new attitude. At the same time, it seems that people wanted to associate that new attitude with a a more grassroots mentality when really I think she was just expressing her own interests and her problems and then the people related. And now those interests and those problems are different and people no longer relate. Does that interfere with her content for some viewers? Sure. But there are still a lot of people who find appeal within her delivery and her style which is still unique and her rather savage nature, which is something that I think can overshadow any consistencies with her past self. Whether her new brand will prevail, well, I guess we'll have to wait and see. So, there was the video, another great one, I hope you enjoyed, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comment section below about what you think about Emma Chamberlain, has she become everything she used to mock or do you think there's been very little change? On top of this, I'd like to thank all my editors who have once again done a fantastic job, I would also like to give a special thanks to some of my Patreons who are up there on the screen now and a special thanks to Ryan who is still very generously donating $100, I'm honestly very flattered that he thinks I'm worth $100. That's that's not what they thought in the brothels. To add an extra bit in here, I also have to give a shout out to Connor, who is my recent new $50 Patreon, and I really appreciate it. My throat is dying from illness right now, but I hope this can serve as a little thank you. Before I get a bit too edgy with my humor, you know, the right opinions, feeling a bit mental today, if you want to message me, you can follow me on Twitter, Facebook, anywhere you want to reach me, get in touch with me, I'm out there in the world. You can join my Discord, that's a great place with some great people. I don't think there's too much else to say, so to conclude, I am the right opinion, and I will see you in the next one.